I am so glad you have joined us this day for worship. Pastor Dennis Goff will be presenting the message this day, and I know it will be a blessing to you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It wouldn't be worship without announcements, right? And I've got a couple of them for you. The first one is, we at Holy Cross have for the last couple of weeks begun to open up worship a little bit more following the dictates of our uh, governing officials. And so what has happened is we continue to have Saturday evening worship at 5 p.m. and Sunday morning worship in the sanctuary, both these in the sanctuary, Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. And now instead of every third pew, we are uh, seating people in every second pew, every other pew, which gives us, oh, about uh, 60 or so more uh, capacity for worship during these services. So uh, continue to go online, sign up for these, but we expect uh, that God will bring to us larger congregations of worshiping people as we continue to uh, safely and faithfully move through this COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And also we, for the near future, will continue the parking lot service on Sunday mornings at 1030 with an eye toward that time when we will open up and have two services in the sanctuary on Sunday. More on that as we go down the road. Monday evening, worship at 6.30 p.m. in the sanctuary. And uh, we enjoyed and have been blessed by these little 242 gatherings, Acts 242, where we continue in just a devotion, confession of sins, and the Lord's Supper. Uh, you can sign up for those. They'll be at 5 and then at 5.30. That gives us time between the second one and 6.30 to prepare for Monday evening worship. So you have a number of great opportunities, including this recording, to worship our great God. And also, this weekend, Sunday, we celebrate Confirmation. Last spring, uh, COVID-19 wiped out our celebration. We rescheduled for the fall. In some ways, that's even better. It doesn't get connected with graduation from elementary school into high school, but rather now, as our young people continue on in high school, they have the opportunity uh, in the midst of new challenges to uh, reaffirm, to confirm the faith into which they were baptized. So that takes place on Sunday afternoon. Now let's worship our great God. We do so calling upon his name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We make confession of our Christian faith and do so using the words of a time-tested statement of belief, a creed, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Nothing compares to this, but a beautiful name it is. 
could not hold you, the veil tore before you. Our scripture reading for today, a portion of which will serve as the text for Pastor Goff's message, is found in Matthew chapter 20, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day? long doing nothing because no one has hired us they answered he said to them you also go and work in my vineyard when the evening came the owners of the vineyard said to his foreman call the workers and pay them their wages beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came in and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So, the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. I now invite Pastor Dennis Goff forward and would like to pray for you, Pastor Goff, as you prepare to share God's word with the good folks gathered this day. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, I thank you for Dennis. I thank you for his friendship, for his collegiality, for the encouragement and counsel he offers to me. 
And Lord, for the talents and gifts you have given him to make your word come alive through the preaching of your precious gospel. We pray for the ultimate source of life this day, for the spirits working and breathing and speaking through that word, so that Pastor Goff's words are your words. And the message he proclaims is your will, your wondrous grace, your forgiveness for those who hear these words. So bless him, bless his words as we ask it. In the name of your Son, the Word made flesh, our Savior Jesus Christ, amen. Pastor Goff. Thank you, Pastor. God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours today in Jesus Christ. Amen. For the kingdom of heaven is like. That's how today's gospel reading begins. For the kingdom of heaven is like. And with that beginning, we know that that triggers for us that there's a parable coming. And as we've learned, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Well, to grasp the meaning of this parable today, let me tell you another parable that I think might drive this point home. I spent most of my years in Central Florida, and so the setting of the parable I'm going to use today will be orange groves that are dot the landscape throughout Central Florida. During the harvest season, I have seen workers in those groves numerous times. So let's imagine. It's a little before 7 o'clock in the morning one day when the owner of the largest orange grove in the county goes down to the local diner downtown looking for some workers. He finds a few guys and he tells them that he will pay each one of them $100 for a day's work. These guys sound, feel like this sounds like a pretty good pay for a day's work, and so they agree to that. A couple hours later, about 9 o'clock that morning, the owner of the Grove is back at that same local diner looking for some more workers. Takes a couple other guys and promises to pay them a decent amount for their time. They, too, agree. About noon that day, the Grove owner does the same thing, and then again at 3 in the afternoon, and also at 5. Each time he recruits a group of new workers, he promises to pay them well for their time. Well, about an hour after that last group of workers showed up at the Orange Grove, the foreman blows a loud horn, signaling it's quitting time. He has all the workers line up, and he pays them all one by one. He lines up the guys he hired first, last, and the ones he hired last, first. With a fresh stack of $100 bills in his hand, he starts to hand them out one by one. Well, you can imagine how excited the guys were who were at the beginning of the line. They had only worked an hour. And here they receive a $100 bill each. And so it goes down the line. Well, seeing what's happening, the guys at the end of the line, the guys who were hired first, they kind of got excited a little bit. They said to themselves, hey, we've been here all day long. We're sure we're going to get a lot more than the guys at the beginning of the line. You take $100, you multiply that by about 10 hours of work, we're going to make out pretty good today. But no sooner did they think that, and they were handed a $100 bill. Hey, wait a minute, they said. What's going on here? You mean that's all we're going to get paid? We worked all day long? Some of the other guys only worked a few hours. They barely broke a sweat. We've been breaking our backs in the heat of the sun all day long, and all we get is a lousy $100? That's not fair. You get the picture? It doesn't seem fair, does it? If that were any of us, we probably would 
think the same thing. Have you ever been in a situation where you've had that thought or said those words? That's not fair. I bet we all have. In that little parable I shared with you, as well as the one that we read from the Gospel, Matthew chapter 20, notice that the guys at the end of the line, those who were hired first, are only comparing themselves to those who have done less than they have. They certainly aren't comparing themselves to someone who may have done more than they did. They certainly aren't concerned about whether someone like that is being treated fairly compared to them, are they? Have you ever noticed how easy it is for us to make comparisons with other people? Well, at least I haven't messed up my life like that person has. At least I've spent a lot more time in church than they have. Well, maybe we wouldn't say those things, but we probably thought those things. But you know, before we are too quick to make comparisons between ourselves and other people, how well do we compare to the one who really matters? God says, be holy as I am holy. In other words, God isn't expecting us to compare ourselves to somebody else, but he, he wants us to compare ourselves to him. And if that's the case, how are we doing? Likewise, God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. So in other words, with every fabric of our being, God wants us to love him completely. With that in mind, how are you doing? Or how about love your neighbor as yourself? Well, that sounds okay, but God, have you noticed my neighbor lately? God, you mean I'm supposed to compare myself to you? Well, that's not fair. You see, the real point that Jesus is making in this parable is that as far as God is concerned, none of this has anything to do with being fair. Instead, it has everything to do with God's undeserved generosity towards us. Maybe we would do well to remember the meaning of the word grace here. Grace means receiving what you do not deserve. And likewise, maybe we would do well to remember the meaning of the word mercy here. Mercy means not receiving what you do deserve. In other words, because of our sin and guilt, we deserve God's wrath and punishment on our lives. But instead, we receive the undeserved generosity of God's pardon and forgiveness. It's not a fair response when you consider our sinful condition. But what a gift from a generous God. Back in the congregation that I pastored in Central Florida for a number of years, one of the teachers there at our school told me a story of something that happened in her family when she was just a little girl. The, the year is 1965, and the setting is a small rural town in Troy, Alabama. The story that she shared with me was about her grandfather, Mr. Benjamin Augustus Hill, better known by the locals as Mr. B.A. Mr. B.A. owned a general store and gas station that was the only general store and gas station for miles around that area. If you needed a pound of sugar or a pound of flour, you would go to Mr. B. Hill's, B.H., B.H.'s general store. If you needed a couple gallons of gasoline, you would go to Mr. B.A.'s general store. 
If your kids wanted some candy or a, a cold Coca-Cola on a hot summer day, you would go to Mr. B.A.'s general store. In those days, most of Mr. B.A.'s customers were low-income farmers who worked the cotton fields of southern Alabama. They received minimal pay for their work, and because of their limited income, most of them usually did not have the money to pay for what they needed at the store. Quite often, they would ask Mr. B.A. if they could make their purchases on credit, and Mr. B.A. would always oblige them. And every time he did that, he, he entered the credit purchase in a ledger book that he kept underneath the cash register behind the counter. One day, Mr. B.A. heard that familiar ring as a car drove over the hose outside of a gas pump that triggered the owner inside that a car was there. Every time he heard that ring, he would go outside and pump the person's gas, and he would invite them into the store to have a look around. He told them he'd be in in a few minutes, and, and they could pay what they owed. Well, this particular day, Mr. B.A. didn't recognize the man who got out of the car. It's kind of unusual because he knew most of the people who lived around that area. Nevertheless, while Mr. B.A. filled the stranger's gas tank, he invited him to make his way into the store and look around. What the man did, however, is that he took all of the cash out of the cash register, and before Mr. B.A. knew what was happening, the man snuck up behind him with a Coke bottle that the man stole out of the store's cooler, struck him over the head, knocking him unconscious, and left him there on the ground as he drove away. By the time someone found Mr. B.A. lying next to the gas pump, in a pool of his own blood, it was too late. He died shortly after arriving at the hospital. In the days that followed, the community mourned the loss of a dear friend, a respected community leader, and a generous man. The morning after the funeral, Mr. B.A.'s granddaughter, the teacher who told me this story, looked out the front window of her grandfather's house where her family was staying as his house was right next to that general store. When she looked out the window, she saw a line of 50 or 60 or more people lined up standing outside the door of the general store. She called for her father who went outside and asked who they were and why they were there. One man spoke up for the rest of the group. We're here to pay our debts, he said. Pay your debts? What do you mean? The, man asked, the son asked. All these years, your father let us buy groceries and gasoline on credit. He lent us money when our children needed a new pair of shoes or, or when our children were sick. We always promised that we would pay him back. We're really sorry that he's gone. But we're here because we believe it's only right to, to settle up what we owe and, and pay our debt. The man went on to say that Mr. B.A. B. A. always recorded their debts in a ledger book that he kept under the cash register. The man told Mr. B.A.'s son that if he would open the store and, and look at the book and, and tell them how much they owe, they would all pay their debt and they'd be on their way. Well, Mr. B.A.'s son got the store keys out of his pocket. He opened up the front door of the store, and once inside, he, he went around to the counter and looked under the cash register, and, and sure enough, there was a ledger book. He opened the ledger book, and an envelope fell out to the floor. He picked it up, and on the outside, in his father's own handwriting, it read, if anything happens to me, please open this letter. He opened the letter and read these words. I know all my customers who bought on credit all these years really can't afford to pay me back. Upon my death, please tell them that they owe me nothing. Their debts are paid in full. Signed, Benjamin Augustus Hill. The son walked outside read his father's letter to the crowd. 
for what seemed like the longest time, they all just stood there in silence. After a few moments of hushed surprise, the son repeated the words. Folks, your debt is paid. You're free to go. You don't owe anything. Why do you suppose Mr. B.A. did that? Did he cancel their debts because that was the fair thing to do? Or did he cancel their debts because he was a generous man? Today's parable from Matthew chapter 20 isn't a story about unfair treatment. Today's parable is a story of a generous vineyard that points us to a generous Father, a generous God who canceled all of our debt and paid all of our debt with his own blood. How fair was that? When you and I consider the kind of generosity shown to us by our Heavenly Father, who could ask for anything more? In Jesus' name, amen. As we reflect upon God's word, let us go to the Lord, confess our own sins. Heavenly Father, all too often, I have cried out how unfair something is. All too often, I have made comparisons to other people and thought better of myself than I should. All too often, I have failed to recognize the generosity that is beyond measure that you have displayed for me. Heavenly Father, for myself and I trust for all who hear these words. We confess our sins to you. And we beg and we plead and we ask for your grace and your mercy. We ask for your grace that you give us out of your love for us what we do not deserve. And we ask for your mercy that you would not give to us what we do deserve. By the promise of Christ's resurrection, his death and resurrection, we have the assurance, we have the gift, we have overwhelming measure of your generous forgiveness. We give you thanks for that. And dear friends, it is my privilege to be able to share with you the generosity of God's forgiveness in your life through his death and resurrection extended to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
generosity, one of the marvelous, wonderful attributes of our God. And God be praised, He enables us to echo His attributes, to display them in our lives as He shapes us to be more and more Christ-like. And one of the ways that we exhibit generosity is through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And we continue to be thankful to God for you and for your generosity as we seek to lift up the cross of our Savior Jesus and to share His generous grace, His mercy with uh, a world so in need of it. So let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, thank You that You are such a generous God. And thank You, Lord, that uh, You transform our lives so that Your generosity might spill over into our hearts and lives and in turn spill over into the lives of others. I thank you, Lord, for this congregation of believers. I thank you for the 75 years that these good folks have been generous in your gifts. Lord, we thank you for these gifts in these trying times and pray that they might be used so that a world so in need of mercy and grace might find it through this ministry. We ask this in the name of Him who is the source of all mercy and grace, Your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As Pastor Goff shared the story of Mr. B.A. Hill and ended with the marvelous words, Generosity, who could ask for anything more? A rock and roll song came to mind because I used to be a rock and roll disc jockey. I thought of a song by The Happenings, actually a song written by George Gershwin called I've Got Rhythm. I've got rhythm, I've got music, I've got my girl. Who could ask for anything more? I mean, life is wonderful when you have those things. But how much more wonderful and profoundly eternity changing is life? when we recognize the generosity of our God. And so that, I would like to be the subject of our prayer this day. We bow our heads to pray. Thank you, God. Thank you for not being fair. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, giving us what we do not deserve. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, withholding that which we do deserve for our sins and guilt. Thank you for that message that says our debt has been paid. Thank you, Lord, for canceling our debt, not because it was fair, but thank you, Lord, for your generosity. Fix our hearts and our hopes this day on the cross. Help us, Lord, in the midst of a world where so often we would lash out in anger or be upset because life doesn't seem fair to realize that in a broken world where there are a number of unfair things, the greatest injustice is the death of your son Jesus his righteousness for our guilt, his forgiveness for our sins. And enable us, Lord, looking at this great gift, living life in light of this great gift, to profoundly realize that when we have your grace, your mercy, your generosity, who indeed could ask for anything more? We pray this, Almighty God, in the name of your Son, Jesus, as we lift up to your throne of grace, in his name and power, the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Pastor Goff, please, a closing thought and a final blessing for us. Considering the incredible generosity that God displays to us, indeed, who could ask for anything more? With that in mind, receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and now and always grant you his peace.